Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I don't want to ever think that we don't have enough time for art. Uh, if the challenge is to bring complexity to our perception, there is no better way than to do that with art. Um, that's what experiencing art is, is responding to complex relational processes, exploring the boundaries of our perception, making sense in new ways. Um, and it includes our intellect, our imagination, our memories. It includes the body. It includes emotions. Uh, these things are not separable, of course. Of course. And yet, in so much of our other discussion and analysis, the first thing we do is separate them. So we need the arts. Thank you. And um, especially for this upcoming session, which is about the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we have quite a few people on this panel today. And we have quite a project in addressing this subject. Um, arguably, the UN SDGs have offered a platform and a, a, a visual, a graphic, a language. Um, it's, it's offered this, this collection of 17 identified issues has offered an entry point um, that is an interesting entry point into this question of how do we address the global situations at local levels, um, or local situations at global levels, or both. So uh, there's no question that it will be impossible to deal with any of the SDGs if we don't have a mindset change to recognize uh, that, it, that that's necessary. So that's a given. Um, and from there, I think that the best thing to do is to start with Petra, who will give us her, um, some of her experience in working with it, and uh, we'll take it from there. Again, each person's going to give a 10-minute, not more, please, um, input, and then we will open it up to discussion. And your job is to not get mad at me if I don't call on you immediately. It's hard for me to find everyone, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Nora. And thank you, Elizabeth has gone. Uh, I must say, the music really touched me and also the film. It reminded me of a very good friend in South Africa of mine who is a member of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And she one day sat, you know, and was sitting on my veranda. Uh, Petra, the most important thing that I learned in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that people who commit atrocities have denied themselves their own humanity. That's why they do what they do. And so we do a lot of atrocities to each other and to the planet. So humanity and coming back to our shared humanity is at the core and it's not an unimportant aspect. So um, yeah, can we have the PowerPoint? Great, so this is about yeah, stewarding sustainability transformation. I would like to quickly go back. I'm following on to Johan Rockström. You, you remember he ended with, we need to steward the transformation. Um, I'm also referring to the last session on mindset shift because there is something we need to integrate between self-mindset, between process, how do we do things, and between systems. And I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on the process, you know, on the how do we actually do this. So just like to go a little bit back, I would like to honor Maya Gopal with her book, Great Mind Shift, because she said transformation means radical, incremental change, and it's not a contradiction. So we look at the situation in the world, and we know how it looks like, and this is collective action, by the way. But this is not the kind of collective action that we're looking for, and I just want to be a bit careful. I'm using 
the term a lot, but it needs to be contextualized. So the collective action that we want is a little bit more like this. You know, we want people to communicate, collaborate, and the core, at the core of SDG transformation is people need to own their own future. There are no losers in the world. People need to own the future and need to shape the future collectively. So that's at the core of my work, and I would like to kind of just quote Grace Lee Box. Those of you who don't know Grace Lee Box, she is a relatively famous American revolutionary. There are some. She turned 100 in 2015 and uh, passed away a couple of days afterwards. She wrote fantastic books, and this quote is from her. The new paradigm we must establish is about creating systems that bring out the best in each other. And that's what we need to go about. So the SDGs are actually a good step forward. The people who invented the visual, I think, were genius. Because what they did, they created something that is alive and that people can identify with. And they can run with this. There is no IP on the visual. People can kind of get the tiles and put them together in a different way. There is a bit of a style guide, you know, but otherwise people can run with it. And I have this um, municipality that we are working with in, in the Netherlands, the smallest municipality in the Netherlands. And they have um, created a global goal academy and they have said, we are the first municipality in the Netherlands, maybe in the world, I don't know. And for us, the SDGs are the core of what we do. We have a network, we, we shift into a network organizations, we have SDG ambassadors, we work with schools and with, with um, other municipalities, we work with enterprises, etc. and they're fired up, and you know what, people have fun. So SDG implementation can be more than a technical implementation challenge, it can be fun. It is, and that's at the core, the, issue is human agency, and do we understand a little bit more about human agency? First question is, what can we learn from successful transformation processes? I grew up in Berlin, and on our daily ride to my school, I was passing the death strip. And in the village that I lived in Berlin, in West Berlin, I could hear the shootings from the border. And for me, this was a system I grew up with until I was close to 30, that could not be changed. And that was that way I was told when I was a child, the system can't be changed. It did. It did. It did. But not just by itself. Quite interesting. In a mix between stewarding, there were a lot of people stewarding this. And it looked like an accident. It wasn't. And people have never gone any any thank you for that. A lot of people were stewarding that. And a lot of people are still stewarding this today, 30 years after this happened. So it needs collective stewardship and it needs self-organization. And I would like to just go a little bit to, there are many examples that, that I'm working with, like uh, be it kind of cross-border trade, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, be it integration of, of um, Eastern Balkan countries into the European Union. Uh, be it um, like, like water management in Tunisia or cl climate action plans in Georgia. So it's everywhere we work, it is about collective stewardship and it's about collective action and, and getting people to understand the future. I would like to zoom in a little bit into, um, into Tunisia. You imagine Tunisia countryside, a drought, a huge drought problem. Um, a government that has changed, you know, where the old structures are still in place, the new structures haven't really materialized, and there are um, attacks by the IS. And a lot of young people are recruited for the IS, Kairan in southern Tunisia. And now, this collective stewardship around water as an SDG took place as a two-year process where it was about getting people into conversation that were fighting with each other like no tomorrow, the, the farmers were stealing water. The government people thought the farmers were crim criminals. Indeed, farmers, st farmers stole water from the pipelines. No communication, nothing. No communication between the government departments. Everything was stuck. And it was possible in a two-year process, and this becomes now quite technical, to steward that people took up shaping their future collectively. Nobody else could be doing it for them. They did it themselves. It was about getting the government departments into a conversation first. They couldn't talk with the farmers. Getting the farmers into conversation with each other, the different 
um, kind of associations, etc. It was of getting getting NGOs involved, and it was about stewarding a top-down and bottom-up process, and that is one of the most important lessons on transformative processes. So, what can we learn? Transformative change works when it attends to systems alive, and suddenly people have the feeling they can shape their future. They were desperate in Chiron, but they had the feeling they can shape their future. And suddenly, the government officials thought, oh, you know, maybe we should talk with the, with the farmers. And interesting enough, it was the farmers who said, you know, can we work with the government together on a water charter? That's what, I, what they did two, two years later, 800 people in the room, and there were tears because they said, for the first time, this happened, that we can create a future together that's different. But it was tangible. There were working groups, there were policies on irrigation, there were policies on drinking water, etc. So there were lots of tangible issues. But it was about getting the human agency together. So we, we worked with a, a compass that you know, some of you might be familiar with or not. But the interesting thing about this compass is that it's a guide. It's an action tool that uh, people can understand. It looks complex, but it's easy to work with. And it has humanity is one of the most important criteria. So whatever process you set up, there are questions on relationship building. There are questions on empathy. There are questions on mindfulness. And people can work with it. It, it works. So it is really about shaping the future together. It's about looking who needs to be engaged in the process. Um, what are the, the existing innovations actually that we can build on, that we don't ignore? Uh, what is it that touches people's hearts? You know, what creates meaning? Because that's what gets people going. And it is about um, looking at differences and expertise and getting people into a conversation that usually don't talk with each other. And it was about relating to a a bigger system and say, you know, who are we doing this for? You know, what's the bigger system? So, and that creates an alive system, a more resilient system, and a system where a self-stewardship of the future can take place. So the next lesson is it transformations need these orchestrated, stewarded processes between different actors. And this is just kind of a quick shot, you can't read it, but it gets as complicated as it gets. This is about sustainable fishery. And you know, you have a multiple actors, international actors, local actors, municipalities, NGOs, government, etc., fisheries, fisheries associations. And you know, like we may have difficulties in, in communicating, collaborating in the Club of Rome, they also have difficulties, you know, and they, but they need to get things going. And this is just with a bit of support of creating processes that really work. So it is about multi stakeholder it's about multi-level, and these have to be coming together. So these different initiatives have to work together. Single initiatives, single projects are not going to work. So if we look at the larger systems, because the issue is that the project approach that we take is not enough. We need to go into larger systems change, and that's where we actually need to ask different questions, and we need to look at what is the bigger system and how can this integrate into transformation systems. So we need to move from a project approach to a multi-stakeholder partnership approach, but we are at the CASP of moving into identifying with transformation systems. So thank you for that. And um, this is all kind of written up in the next report to the Club of Rome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petra. Um, our next speaker will be Hans. And while he's getting ready, I would just like to speak to something that Tomoyo brought up this morning around uh, the, the ants' eyes and the birds' eyes, this process of zooming in and zooming out, the details and the patterns, um, and, and how important that is in this process. Um, are you ready, Hans? Um, I'm ready. All right. I mean, it's not there yet, but uh, I have a few words to say before. Okay, anyone, so. go ahead then. Oh, yeah, good afternoon. Great pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. I'm a member of the Club of Rome since about like two and a half, three years now. Yeah, but the first time I really get uh, practically involved. And uh, throughout yesterday and so far today, you know, sort of wondering, okay, what are we here for? 
and you can see that I put my sleeve back so the jacket is also left behind because we need action and we heard this many times and I think there's a lot of things we know how to do so we need to go out there and do them. We still need to talk about the bigger picture as we talked yesterday and today but eventually things are happening out there, it's getting warmer and I think somebody has to do something. So that's what um, I thought we need to, to, to move uh, with and we have now given, been given this universal framework, the SDGs. And I think that this is really the first time on a universal, on a global level, we have a, a framework, a legal framework. People have actually committed, 193 countries have committed to this. So, I mean, we can talk about many other things we need to do, but that's the one thing I think everyone needs to concentrate now to really to, to move ahead. Oh, I'm in charge here, actually. So just to say that what I'm talking about is the experience of work we have done in these, what, 40 plus countries already. So um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of what we do. Now, most of the, when you go out there, about, talk about SDGs, you go to government, civil society, even the private sector, they are paralyzed by this complexity. They say, well, how can we deal with these 169 targets, 242 indicators, and oh, and this is an excuse not to get started or to do something. They say, oh, how are we going to do it? Uh, who is going to do it? And actually, most government we go and try to work with, for example, they don't even have a place where somebody is in charge. So we are already three years into the process, and many countries, in particular the developed ones, have no place exactly where we can go to start and discuss how are we going to go about it. And, never, and so this complexity here, is, is really paralyzing people. And uh, I think we can do better. And we have tools to really move, move on with that. I'm sure so. Oh. Hmm. Going on there. Oh, okay. So this is actually what you find, you usually go to government, silos. We all have talked about silos, but so how do we actually change something about these silos? Because right now what's happening in many places is each silo takes their own uh, uh, goal and say, okay, I'm going to do it. Not really thinking about, you know, what about doing it together? And I think in order to do things together, uh, you, you need tools. And that's, I think, what we have been trying to do. Uh, and there's a, a, a tool in a toolbox which will help deal with this issue, this big challenge on how are we going to deal with 17 goals um, to make this sustainable development. And the question is, how much resources, where to put them, when and where is the money coming from? So everybody's always complaining it costs more money. Actually, it's the governments would say, all right, we put all the money we have now on the side and now rearrange everything, not complaining that we need more money. That's what you hear all the time. No, start from new. There's so much waste everywhere. So again, using models, you can actually start from, from zero. And so what we have done, this is thing you can actually download it and play around with, it's called the ISDG. It's actually a, 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 a development of the World Tree model 40 some years later. What's the machine behind it? And basically what you do is there are, I'm not sure if there's a pointer here. No, oh, sorry. Uh, whatever, so, so you can click on a goal, whatever that may be, infrastructure, and then you have options and you have policies, choices. How much money are you going to put in this? Close the box, go to any other goal you want to, choose other policies, and within a few seconds on your laptop, you can recalculate uh, a new, new scenario, uh, scenario and see how you move um, versus the business as usual. And what's interesting is that actually what happens here, and that tool, anyone can use it, uh, what happens is the red line is the business as usual and the blue one is what have you now done better with investments in whatever that was like in the infrastructure. But you can actually add as many as you want and, and play around. If you don't have enough money in your bank account, the model will stop. If there's not enough resources, it will stop. So it actually is, is connected to uh, many, many uh, 150 databases in the background. And the, the results can be presented in many different ways, like this wheel here, everybody's got the little pin here, all right? So you can have the base scenario, you can have the scenario for the national strategy, which many countries already have, or you can say, we're going to have a new SDG strategy. And you can even see how much more money it will take than what you already have. 
to, to meet the targets within uh, the time we have uh, 2030. The other interesting thing about using models to help our mind, because we are limited in, in how much var or many how variables we can handle, right? Three or four, something like that. So the models, several thousands. And you can then see you know, where do you get the positive synergies and where you get the negative. And so you can optimize the use of your funding. And that's all actually for each scenario. You can just look at what you're doing. Now, the process is important. Because what you want to do is not having it only the government do that in a little place somewhere. You want to do that with the stakeholders. The SDGs are meant to be inclusive and integrated and multi-stakeholder. And so the way to do this is actually to take this model out, go to the people and work with the people. The model actually is customized to each country with the multi-stakeholders. So it reflects exactly what's happening in the country and the wishes, etc., for the country. And so you, it's a process of going around in, in a spiral where as you go, you get better. You get more people involved in the process. And actually, even more people will be involved very soon because November 1st in Geneva, we're going to launch the smartphone and the tablet version of uh, this uh, model so that more people can get involved. More people can actually look at what would happen if we do this or that. People can come with all kinds of ideas and um, that's the way, I think at least, we can move forward because we have to get the people involved. They have to become part of uh, the, the, the work uh, we need to do. And here again, so in summary, um, if you look at government, NGOs, development partners, they also need to have these tools in that toolbox where there's many other tools to actually work on these SDGs. Um, to look at the current performance. Now, who, looks, who has looked at that? And if you look at the current performance, you look at that business as usual. It is lousy, almost in every country. Very bad. So we need to improve that. So then you can evaluate the alternative, again, w with the model, and you can do policy coherence. That's what the, the, it's really something which, unless we have it, we're going to waste more money and we miss all the targets and we go all fry, as we have seen or heard in the last few days. And um, again, if you want the people to come around the table, you have to give something they can play with, they can look at immediately, not a uh, report coming out in a week's time uh, after somebody cranks some numbers nobody understands. And um, that's, I think, one of the ways to really uh, successfully um, uh, fulfill the national development plans and get to the results we expect uh, for the 2030 uh, agenda. So I think we have the tools, we have many tools in our toolbox, let them put together, let's work together, because that's another problem. You know, everybody comes up with their own little thing. And uh, you just look at the UN uh, website, you have all these different things which do not really work together, unfortunately. So I think we need to see there's a hierarchy of tools um, and they need to start to work together. So to me, like, I think we, we have what we need, let's just put it uh, to work as soon as possible and make this complexity which is out there manageable. And we can do it because we all know about system dynamics here and these other tools have been developed now a long time ago. Let's put them to use. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Um, and our next speaker is Enrico. Um, just reflecting right away, uh, remembering that there was this moment that you brought up, Petra, of how impossible it was um, to deal with the Berlin Wall, and also recognizing in Hans this question of the impossibility of dealing with complexity. And uh, we've gotten over it before. So, Enrico, tell us what's happening in Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to have, yes, great. Um, I'm very happy to speak here on behalf of the Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development, which is one of the co-organizers of this event. And uh, as uh, you were able to put down the wall, we were able to put Italians together, which is almost as difficult <laughs> as destroying uh, the Berlin Wall, let me say, in this way. Uh, I will focus uh, on a few points, but uh, I, I just say 
that uh, I fall in love uh, with the limits of growth when I was a student, uh, second year of university in economics, and since then I decided to try to become an economist to save the world. And so I'm very honored to be part of the Club of Rome and speak this afternoon. Um, I was involved in the preparation of the Agenda 2030. Ban Ki-moon asked me to run a task force on the issue of data and not just indicators in preparation of the, and also the European Commission. But let me briefly describe what ASVIS is. Is according to what we have seen around the world, an almost unique experience because we are bringing together more than 220 organizations, not individual organizations. Most of them are associations, business associations, uh, trade unions, and so on and so forth. So we are covering almost all parts of Italy. And uh, we work on a r wide range of issues, and uh, we are completely funded by ourselves and our uh, members, plus some sponsorships. Uh, this is what we do. We are already in all Italian schools. 33,000 teachers have taken our e-course. 58,000 will do it next year in cooperation with the Ministry of Education, even with the previous government. We have established the network of 59 universities for sustainable development who are changing now their curricula and not only their managerial uh, way of managing the university. We are doing masters uh, also for journalists, for uh, managers in public administrations. We do a lot of uh, um, different activities and we also do statistical research and modeling. Uh, one of the main activities is the organization of the Italian Festival of Sustainable Development. 17 days all over the country. We had this year 700 events. It's a unique experience uh, in worldwide uh, as far as we know. Uh, but what we do is also uh, policy making and institutional building. We have now in the Italian Parliament uh, a proposal to change the Constitution and put the, pro the concept of sustainable development in the Constitution because this is about intergenerational equity that does not exist almost in any Constitution around the world. I'm very keen that France, uh, Switzerland, uh, Belgium, Norway did it recently and uh, I'm very proud that there is a proposal at the Parliament now. We have designed and then given to the former prime minister a directive uh, for the uh, Italian government, and we hope that the new government will implement it. I met the prime minister a few days ago. Um, we have taken the beyond GDP indicators that the movement I launched when I was chief statistician of the OECD in 2004, we embedded now in the budget law. And the government, before adopting the budget law, have to simulate the impact of policies on uh, CO2 emissions, uh, inequality, poverty, uh, gender balance, uh, crime, and so on and so forth. This is part of our law now. Uh, we are trying to change, uh, we have built a, a parliamentarian intergroup on sustainable development and we are doing many other things. Uh, uh, we had the most of the current uh, um, parties signing uh, 10 points uh, manifesto before the elections and now we are pushing uh, for their implementation. But we publish an annual report, copies are available there, also an executive summary in English. And this has also, in my view, a very important tool. You cannot communicate anything with 242 indicators, nothing. So what we are, have tried to do is to build these composite indicators out of uh, 150 indicators, and you have uh, a dashboard with 17 indicators, and now we have it also at regional level and almost at city level. And through this, you can understand what's going on, but it doesn't tell you how much is missing from the end of the uh, 2030. We also do uh, modeling through a model established, uh, developed by the ANI Foundation, ANI Mattei Foundation. Uh, it's a general equilibrium model covering uh, the rest of the world. So it's not a model as good as what Jorgen showed yesterday, but it shows the possible interactions 
with different elements. We have built 28 indicators that are close to the SDGs, and we have used last year, for Italy, for example, the, this model to show the business as usual, the policy scenarios, and especially what we have uh, demonstrated uh, is that uh, changing policies, we can improve the situation, but to a certain extent. And uh, the most important element is that the model provides you with uh, trade-offs, showing how the simultaneous implementation of policies can change the trade-offs and reduce the overall cost of moving towards 230. So we are pushing now the government to do the same because our model is not very far from what they are doing. Now, let me uh, go to the European level. I've been uh, uh, a uh, consultant uh, to the cabinet of President Juncker and now uh, other DGs and, so, and also the parliament uh, trying to have uh, some of the parties who will run uh, for the next elections using uh, the Agenda 2030 as the framework. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm sorry that I'm not in Brussels today to finalize the report on these issues that will be published soon. And I'm very uh, pleased to report that some of the political forces in the parliament, especially in the current political uh, uh, situation with populists and so on, are happy or are trying to understand how to use the Agenda 2030 to design their platform, their manifesto, and their policy. There are many ways in which the EU can do it, and I'm very proud or uh, happy to be European because in the Treaty of the European Union, sustainable development is quoted twice, both to drive internal policies and to drive policies, external relations with the rest of the country. Now, the problem is how to make it in practice, practical. This is why I, uh, using uh, Bob Costanza and others, a famous chart uh, where I added uh, one sm small box uh, and uh, which links the different elements. What I added is the so-called social system services, similar to the uh, ecosystem services, because the wastes that we are producing are not only physical, but also human. And if you put this on this chart, the 17 goals, you don't think anymore to the SDGs as a list, but as a complex plan to change the different pieces of the system. Now, how can we make it attractive to policymakers? The rest of my presentation, I don't have time, I'm sorry for that, it talks about this, but just uh, if I have one minute, not more, uh, to uh, conclude, uh, by the way, we have built also indicators for uh, European countries. On our database, you have all the composite indicators for countries. The point is that you never be elected if you just say the world is going to collapse. That is the truth. You have to provide solutions, you have to provide a vision. Now, what we have built with the European Commission, with the JRC, is a vision that is built around shocks, small shocks, large shocks, big shocks, and so the transformation is part of the policies that we need to build to make this working in the future. Let me just conclude. In this way, we can put aside the classical separation of economic policies social policies, environmental policies, and we can try to use these five keywords, prevent, prepare, protect, promote, transform. If you use this that we developed at the UN uh, in 2014 with the UNDP uh, report, you can think about integrated policies that overcome the classical silos. So the good thing is that people are now looking uh, for this kind of solutions. Let me go to the last slide that you can read by yourself. We are scared of populism. We are scared of emerging fascism. We are scared of for many things. But the good thing is that there isn't 
only one way to do it. There are many ways to fight against this. And I quote this from The Political Brain from Drew Weston, a great book that I would recommend you to read, where we can, looking at facts, science, build a narrative that will rescue our countries, our regions, our world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrico. It's so impressive what's happening here. It's really a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so Jinfeng Zhu will give us another uh, perspective now coming from China. What's happening on that side of the world? Uh, I would like to introduce a few areas we are doing among others about uh, SDG. And first is GEP. Together with IUCN and the Chinese Academy of Science, we developed a set of methodology and applied to some areas of China, that is gross ecosystem, okay, gross ecosystem product. In, instead of GDP, we set up this concept and applied to areas to encourage local officials to consider more about the ecosystem, about water, about air, about forestry, about those ecosystems. We are working, uh, apply this to several areas. Areas is get a great success. Local government are not that much worried about uh, new set of new factory. They are concerned about concern the environments that concerned about the ecological uh, system. And uh, this methodology already accepted by central government. So that is not the only, uh, now GDP is not the only uh, standard um, local officials are concerned. Now GEP is also a major concern that make a fundamental change because in China the government has very strong uh, influence over economy and over industries. Through this, we point out a new area, and uh, this is what we have done. Second, we call it uh, CCEFA. In, in 2016, a few hundred birds called Great Bastard landed at the uh, Yellow River banks. Those birds in the whole world only have a few hundreds. But those birds do not know where is the state protected area. The birds don't know, do not know. So they just landed at the Yellow River Bank. Some Chinese people started to hunt in them. My volunteers find this truth, want to protect them. They go to the government, the government say, oh, we need three years to evaluate, to, 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 to see if it's possible, and we need more year to set up the state protect the area. So my foundation, when we heard that, the, the next morning, that's 2016, April 18th, we give the, the, the certificate, we give the panel, we give them a name called the China Conservation Area, for Great Bastard, that's the bird's name. And Changyuan, that's the county's name. Through that, with our certificate, they go to the police, go to the government, it works great well. And in that year, no single bird hurt or left in that area. During the spring, all of them fly back to Russia, to Mongolia, to the back. Starting that day, about two years ago, now we have over 80 protect, we call it CC, CICFA, CCF. In the whole world, uh, in whole China, we already have over 80 CICFA to protect all the, those wildlife, to protect uh, those fish, birds, everything. That's another creative activity of New has done and uh, make a great success. The third I would like to 
uh, introduced is EPIL, Environmental Public Interest Litigation. According to new environment law of China, effected the uh, 2015s, social uh, organizations can participate through the polluter on behalf of public interest. And we start that, we take that to immediately, till today, we filed almost 100 cases nationwide to sue local government, to sue state enterprises, as well as private enterprise, to protect the environment and the ecological surroundings. For example, we sued the state investment corporation for to stop them to build a hydraulic uh, power station. Because with that power station, the river, the fish, the ecosystem will be destroyed. We successfully stopped that huge project. Another example is for green energy. We have in China, we have many uh, wind energy, solar energy, but because the development is too fast, Many of them cannot be connected to the grid, state grid. So some of them, a big portion, say 40%, are lost it just because it was not connected to the grid, state, state grid. So we also found a case against the state grid. That may change dramatically. And uh, the next example is pangolin, uh, the pangolin scale. And uh, because of TCM issues, Chinese, according to Chinese, uh, uh, pharmacopoeia of China, the pangolin scale can, is, is TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. So because of that, although we have the law protect the pangolins, but still pangolins, Chinese pangolins, is gone after 20 years of protection. No, we, now we, we, together with our volunteers, we do study, find out the problem. We file litigation against the Guangxi Autonomous Government Administration of Forest in charge of this sector. And uh, we find out this send some the confiscated pangolin and scale to, to pharmaceutical company, to trading company. And then, through our activity, that make a big shock nationwide. Now, officials related, companies related, stop that kind of, I'm not saying 100%, but it's really a big shock. That's the third area we are working on. The fourth is uh, we have a Guangcai program 20 years ago, which we provide policy support to encourage private enterprises to invest in the poor area. In instead of simply give them money, we encourage them to start business there. Through this, we get 20 millions Chinese Get over, get out of poverty for the last 20 years. And as the same, at the same time, we get many tens of thousands private enterprises get very good. And uh, for those you think uh, we are doing good, come on, join us to make it better. For those you think China is not doing the good, come on, join us, make it good. And uh, on this occasion, I'm proud to announce an important agreement uh, to advance the vision of the Club of Rome in essential global and very public area, linking climate-friendly travel, conservation, and green development. It's between two members of the Club of Rome, myself and my friend uh, Jeffrey Liebman, and uh, who runs a foundation which is a legacy to our mentor and very close friend, Mr. Maurice Strong, one of the fathers of the sustainability thinking in action. The Strong Universal Network is promoting climate-friendly travel. Last, uh, 
we will de develop our network in China and around the world. And uh, through strong climate action events and build a movement of bright young climate champions ready to sustain the change we need. Thank you. Thank you, Jinfeng. Um, I'm just so reminded of that old saying that, you know, change changes as it changes. Uh, and when we're trying to find solutions and lock into them, you know, the birds don't know where the preservation areas are, and the birds are going to new places. So this task is made extra challenging by that process, and I'm, I'm so curious um, to hear more about that. Um, our next speaker is one of our co-presidents, Manfela, uh, can tell us some of what's happening in the African continent. I want to return us to where we left off before we went to lunch. We had this very interesting conversation about uh, what kind of civilization. I just want to return all of you to your, the cradle of humanity where all of us come from, Africa. Africa is not just the cradle of humanity in terms of the physical human evolution, but also in terms of it being the first place where human civilization emerged. And I think there are some lessons from how the human race evolved in a space which was untouched by, obviously, other beings other than the natural environment of which you were a part. And I think there is much wisdom to be learned from how was it possible that we evolved amongst the lions, amongst the, all of the predators that were around us because there were no camps. And I think this realization is beginning to dawn on biologists. And I want to remind you of a beautiful saying in a book by Andreas Weber, who asked us to take seriously in his book, The Biology of Wonder, as a scientific fact, the idea that the natural world is not comprised of biological machines. It's a sensuous, pulsating reality. And his words, which I think I can't improve on are, uh, in the ecological commons, a multitude of different individuals and diverse species stand in various relations with one another. Competition, cooperation, partnership, predation, productivity, and destruction. All these relations, however, follow one higher law, which is over the long run, only behavior that allows for productivity of the whole ecosystem, and that does not interrupt itself, production is amplified. The individual can only realize itself if the whole can realize itself. Ecological freedom obeys this form of necessity. The deeper, the deeper the connections in the system, the more creative niches it will afford for its individual members. And in my continent, we call this Ubuntu. The I see you in me and you see me in, in you. And this relational construct this philosophical orientation that ties us together inextricably, that I can't call myself human unless I recognize your humanity. This is profound. 
And this approach, if we were to return to it, not as a slogan, but as a lived reality, I think we'll be able to answer the question, by what values should we be governing the economic commons? The sad reality is because we departed from this, that the commons, which is the wildlife, the beautiful landscapes of the African continent, has been decimated. I think it was Herbie who said that Julius Caesar looked at North Africa and saw a food basket and therefore created decimation which led to the Saharan desert and of course desertification continues. The question we have to answer as we deal with this reality and the tool that has been afforded by the SDGs is how are we going to heal the wounds that were inflicted on this cradle of humanity, which is an ecosystem today that probably has the most unique species of wildlife, trees, and has the potential to be the lung for this planet that is suffocating from the pollution. And I want to, in considering this issue of how do we heal this cradle of humanity, I want to read you a poem from a book that was given to me this morning by Daishaku Keita, Akeda. I can't pronounce it probably properly, but here is the, the poem. A mountain represents its people. Nature represents its people. Landscapes are mirrors presenting people's hearts, just as gardens offer images of their homeowners' hearts. Landscapes reflect the hearts of their citizens. I bring to you bleeding hearts from my continent. Someone was telling me at lunchtime that there are plans to drill into wetlands in, in the Af uh, one of the African countries in return for rents of $600 million a year. There is no price you can attach to those wetlands. But that's going to happen unless we, the people, we, the global community, recognize that for as long as Africa's natural resources have no value, they are not calculated in the GDP of the world. And our politicians take the first 600 million and sell a totally irreplaceable ecosystem to the highest bidder. And you and I are responsible as stewards of that heritage that we owe not just to our children's children, but to the future generations that deserve better. And I believe we have the capacity if our mindset shifts from what can we do for them to say, what can we do for us? Thank you. I'd like to uh, open it up to the room now. Uh, and see what, what comes up. Um, this time, could I have some assistance, please, in figuring out who to choose for these comments? Um, 
I think there was one over here first, and then after that, can you please just find the next person? No. Here. Thanks very much. Very enlightening. I would like to ask a question to Hans and Enrico. Ecological economists famously differentiate two worldviews, the weak and strong sustainability, meaning that in, under weak sustainability, uh, all the trade-offs are allowed. You could exchange some economic growth for some life expectancy, for some birds, for some CO2 emissions reduction. Under strong sustainability, this is not allowed. So you're slightly more conservative, but you're prepared to accept improvement in, across the board in maybe smaller improvement. I would like to ask how is the differentiation between the strong and weak sustainability is addressed in your models, SDG related, of course. Take a couple more questions. I would like to please request that you keep your comments as quickly as possible, as short as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you so much to the panel. Uh, I just want to mention something that uh, somehow is missing in this conference, which is Latin America. Uh, and I would like to, to, to link this with the SDGs, uh, not just in the case of Latin America, but in particular in the case of Mexico. Uh, for instance, we cannot talk about one Mexico. There are many Mexicos in Mexico. So the SDGs can work in a very different way in the north of the country than in the south. I mean, we have states that they grow 7% per year, 6% in the north, but in the south, as in, Latin, in Central America and Latin America, there are some states that they grow 0% or less than 0%. And with this broken society, as Manfila said, and with these birds that, that uh, Jinjen just mentioned, I mean, the, how they go from one place to the other, not just the birds that are coming from Canada to Mexico, but also the, me the birds that are in Mexico City, they are threatened by civilization. So how can we do to open our hearts in a different way in order to have a much equitable development, because it's, it's not a matter of, of growth, it's a matter of development as well, and, and also as part of, of civil, uh, education, like a solution of, of civilization. So uh, I want to, to, to have your, your, your feelings about that. Okay, being the oldest member of the Club of Rome entitles you to be a little longer than one minute. First of all, we heard about the need for finances for the environmental crisis all over the world. Federico Mayor, the former director of UNESCO, sent us a note yesterday evening. Some of you have read it. The world is spending today $4 billion in arms every day. My God, if we can change that, $4 billion a day. Now, how can we change that? If we can't, there will be money for environmental crisis. Second, I'd like to mention, because Manfella mentioned the Africa. I did this before. A, a friend here knows about my thinking. You know, in Brazil, we have 210 million people today. In the city of Brasilia, which was created 12 years before the Club of Rome, we have today, when it was designed for 700,000 people, Today is 2.8 million people, 1.3 million cars. Hmm. That's incredible. Okay, if we have this, those cars, they will have gasoline, CO2 will be up there. But we don't forget, we have something called ethanol. Some people don't believe in ethanol. Okay, ethanol is produced from sugar cane in Brazil, in the United States from from corn. Okay, ethanol today employs in Brazil two million people producing ethanol all over the country. We produce enough ethanol that today I have two cars, one mine or one of my wife. Each car runs on 27% ethanol. All cars of the country. I'm not talking a small number. So why don't you consider that? How can we then help Africa to develop ethanol? Because it's for sugar cane, it would produce food, it would export, you could export to Europe, 
to Asia. So it's, it's a fantastic possibility, but nothing has really been done strongly on that. There's a movement from Brazil to the Embrapa for formulation, and I think we can help. So it would be a good idea if my fella could take this message to other countries in Africa. Thank you. This section began with beautiful music and it ended with beautiful words. Beauty is a decisive dimension. When astronauts saw uh, see our planet from outside, they see the beauty of the planet, the only living planet in the known cosmos. And they immediately find wonderful words, words of love for the planet. That's the same what I said before. We need more loving beauty, loving our planet, loving landscape, loving people, and loving animals and plants. Thank you. In the International Monetary Fund, as I understand it, um, so-called developed nations has about, have about 60% of the votes because they're given out by GDP, but they have about 15% of the world population. Would you all commit to agreeing to the statement that we should democratize the IMF? Let's take the panel a little bit, and then we'll get back to the questions. Anybody want to respond immediately to any of that? Let me start with uh, the oldest member of the club. I think uh, my limited knowledge about ethanol is that it's, a bad, it's bad news for the environment. And I wouldn't want us to get there. We have God's son plenty of wind, and we've got two oceans plus the Mediterranean Sea, which has got, is full of seaweed. We need to use nature as is and not, because the sugar cane is a, an alien plant, and therefore it has its impact. So I think I appreciate your interest in helping us, but we've got to first leverage the natural resources and turn them into assets. The second point is, I couldn't agree with you more about beauty being an asset. And I think if we forget the beauty and what keeps me going on my continent is, I think it's got some of the most breathtaking places. And when you see the majesty or the majestic nature of a rhino or an elephant, you just, weep with joy and, and so on. The billions for the arms, I think that's a subject for mobilization of citizens against those who are the arms dealers. Yeah. Yes, on the question of weak and strong sustainability, I think that uh, we are clearly asymmetric. Now, thanks to the work done by Jochen Rockström and many others, we have an idea of what kind of thresholds we have on the environmental side. But we don't have a clue on what, is the social, what are the social thresholds. Uh, personally speaking, I'm very worried about uh, environmental unsustainability, but we will crash well before for social unsustainability. And this is uh, something, maybe because I was Minister of Labor and Social Policies, and this is where we can do immediately much more than what we could do and we must do on the environmental side. Now, the point is that social policies are seen as uh, coming after the economic uh, uh, policies. And this takes us uh, in a completely 
wrong direction as we did with the environmental point. Here, I think uh, that the issue of inequalities is huge, of course, and then we must mobilize at least those politicians who want to go in the opposite direction of the direction that we took over the last few years. Unfortunately, in Europe, this is not the mainstream. So this is why the work on new economics uh, is so important in order to show how the different unsustainabilities are coming together and creating a, a non-linear situation exactly like uh, the non-sustainability on the environmental side is creating non-linearities. But as I try to explain, this is very hard to sell to politicians. And uh, if you wish, we will come back as club or another time, when we are trying to, on what we are trying to build as a positive message, not rosy message, but integrating this work on resilience instead of just building walls to avoid shocks. This is, if you wish, is the alternative that we have before us. Um, Hans and then Petra. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, seeing is believing. And that's why I think when you use models who, are, who have the capacity to visualize different scenarios, that's how you can actually uh, show people what would happen if they would do this, that, or something else being in the economic sector, the social, or the env environmental. I think that's, actually, that's why we have these models. They're not perfect, but I think they would show the trends very quickly. And so, um, whatever choices you make or you think you should make, and then you can see it, oh, going the right direction or, or not, depending on what you want. And, uh, you know, there's a saying back in Switzerland, there's many ways to roam, and I think that's actually the point. Because you can go over the Alps, then you have to be equipped. We have to have the right tires, the right car or something, or you can go around and then you can go maybe even on foot. Uh, you have to know which road you are so you can measure progress. You're also going to go to Rome. And I think the different routes are different politics. There are different choices um, which you can take. But that has to be done, again, with, with the, the, the stakeholders. People have to be we're sitting together and look at this together so that they actually can uh, concentrate on, 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 the, on what they want to do. And that's the same for the arms. I mean, it's part of the budget. So, all right, you can spend more money on, on guns and then you have less money to do something else because it's, it's, it's a finite pot. And I think that's the, 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 what I think would allow people to make better decisions. And I want to uh, agree here with uh, Monfele about this whole issue of, of ethanol. You know, I'm in, in agriculture uh, a lot, and I know what Embrapa is doing in Africa. I think wrong direction. Large-scale agriculture, chemicals, I mean, that's producing things we don't need. More sugarcane. We need to get off the, 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 the fossil fuels and even the, the non-fossil, but they use water, land, which we actually want to preserve for our birds and our biodiversity, not just plow everything and produce more. Because as we know, you build more roads, you have more cars. You produce more ethanol, you're gonna have more cars uh, soon. So I think these are societal choices. We need to decide what do we want. And I think the, the, the way to do this is really to look at our future using tools people have developed ever since uh, Jay Forrester started with those system models. I think that's, that we have them, so let's use them. Petra. Yeah, I would like to. I would like to pick up the beauty uh, because the beauty is extremely important and we completely ne neglect it because without the arts, of course, we wouldn't survive. And um, Mampela was quoting Andreas or referring to Andreas Weber. He's a German biologist, a semi-biologist, a very, very interesting read, The Biology of Wonder, because what he uh, says is that we are totally and utterly dependent on nature and not in a rational thing, but in an emotional relationship. So we are interconnected with beauty. And we know this in our relationship, or if it is absent, we also notice that. And we notice it when we feel it in nature, and all of us at some stage go to a beach or a wonderful sunset, or you know, we nourish ourselves with, with beauty. 
And the, the interesting thing is that, that this, it, it is so extremely important in SDG implementation to overcome the split between what Ken Wilber says, Wonderland and Flatland, because we're operating in Flatland, and that is all the rational models and the implementation plans, and nothing is wrong about it. It's right, we need targets, that's perfectly right. But we need to bring the humanity aspect, the beauty aspects in, and not as an addition, not as, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of a nice picture or, you know, like, we need to fully integrate this, these aspects into our planning. They need to be integrated plannings that integrate flatland and wonderland aspects. So my encouragement or my, you know, like my offer is, uh, as I'm heading the, the Club of Rome initiative on new enlightenment or new civilization, new humanism, etc., is to say, let's get into a conversation how these models that you have developed or other models could integrate the wonderland aspect that is so extremely important for our transformations. Just one word on arms. I know that this is an unintended consequence, but if a politician looks at these trends and doesn't believe that we can turn up, building arms is a very rational choice. So what I want to say is that I, either we are able to show a pathway which is feasible and then you can decide not to use money for arms but uh, for transferring uh, your technologies to something else or we shouldn't, be, sh we shouldn't be naive. A lot of people who are very worried about their future are buying arms. And maybe you have read on the, uh, I think, New York Times or Guardian that some people are building bunkers in New Zealand to be sold to very rich people in the Silicon Valley. So this is happening, and this is, of course, not a solution, maybe for them, but I don't know. But we must be coherent, and we shouldn't be just naive saying we shouldn't spend money on arms, because that is a very rational behavior, unfortunately, if we believe with the Club of Rome limits of growth original plans that we are going to have a collapse. So people are defending them. As uh, Zygmunt Bauman said, the retrotopia that we are observing around us is the utopia or going back, not going ahead, but just going back, is a reality around us because if we are not successful and convincing on the fact that we can move uh, towards this green scenario, people will prepare themselves to the worst scenario, and this will just accelerate the problem. And the social side is what is accelerating everything because people vote and therefore politicians are interested in keeping their power. Let's start with Anders. Th thank you. Um, thank you for this discussion and I'm, I'm very happy to see that both Enrico and Hans that you have developed models that aim at policy integration and to moving away from the silo mentality that still dominates so much. And I think Yin Feng aimed at, is aiming at that also. My question is, having heard Johan Rockström and Jürgen Randers yesterday, in their, I think, very interesting report. I think what they point at is that conventional growth will not make it, uh, and that incrementalism will not make it. We need bold decisions aiming at transformation of sectors, of policies. And Jürgen had, uh, alluded to it this morning. I don't have to repeat it. My question is, within your respective domains of work and responsibility, we, how, will you, how will you try to act upon this call for transformational change? That, I think, is a, is a very, very important question. Over here. Thank you. Uh, maybe I just try to link with that kind of question. China 
on one hand is following all the uh, Westerns doing. So China is actually an experimental field nowadays, I think. How many people has been to China? Can you raise a hand? Wow. How many people has cooperation with China projects? Wow. Can we find a way to link all these projects and link that with the SDG 17? And that makes China a brilliant way to demonstrate, which just uh, Anders mentioned about. Is that okay? <laughs> China Banking, Global Commons Alliance, and with Council of Global Issues in Toronto. I applaud the design of this panel, because it really, after 20 years with uh, Bertrand Schneider on media and policy, we are coming to constructive ways to really do the interlinkages, and not just with words or images, but integral. So you see, we play with young people with three-dimensional SDGs. With Tony Judge, we do it since two years. How to address the intersectorial strategic dilemmas was before Rio. So that is the bifurcations of what you uh, were, were mentioning. What I want to say is, how can we make it solid? How can we make it concrete? And I think then we have to look into what are models. There are scale models, there are immersive models, and I think we have to step out of the box, not just flatland, colorland, future land, but really integrating the eyes, integrating the scales, and ma making it concrete. I see since 40 years some improvements here. This is really a, a spark of hope that we leave uh, the dilemmas of the ego and come to really multi-stakeholders. And I think, we, as we have seen, the chance after 50 years, now sinking into the old idea of bringing the women, the arts, the children, the indigenous people in, as we tried the linkage between the Club of Rome and Club of Budapest. I think this should be something to revisit the early reports of the Club of Rome, Predicament of Mankind. And I really in, in, invite you to keep on trucking and invest into the leverage points, according to Donella Meadows, and expand the solution spaces. Thank you. So we'll take uh, two more questions, one from the back. I can't, whoever, and then one up here from the front. Yeah, um, so I work for Systemic, a firm that tries to catalyze system change. And we are a lot about uh, um, actions, not only talk. And building on um, the Millennium Institute's beautiful model on really measuring and trying to do radical incremental change, I want to ask you, what are the concrete steps that the Club of Rome with its influence can take today, this week, and this month to make sure that the model by the Millennium Institute get implemented in as many countries as possible, as soon as possible. And I think that would be a tremendous step to get to the um, radical change that Anders just referred to. Thank you very much. This is part of the reflections of this morning. And we've thanked Aurelio Pache, the founder, and his co-conspirator, uh, Alexander King. But we've heard very little about the woman who wrote Limits to Growth and did many of the algorithms. And I think we should pay a tribute to her, Danella <laughs> Meadows.
think we should take some more comments from the panel if there's someone wants to respond. I should answer to uh, Anders. Uh, one, uh, uh, in terms of policies, I think that we have to go towards uh, minimum income subject uh, to reactivation of people, so it's not universal income, but uh, it's minimum income subject to reactivation, and circular economy are the two key words. But let me uh, tell you what I'm trying to do in the World Commission on the Future of Work that I'm part of at the ILO. When I was at the OECD Chief Statistician, I managed to change the rules for GDP worldwide, including, for example, research and development as an investment at the time was considered as a cost, and now everybody's counting this as an investment. What I'm trying to do, I failed uh, 10, 15 years ago on this, is uh, to count people as part of the assets of the companies. They're counted, as you know, as a cost. And there is no way to have in future enough money for training, continuous training, if we do not change this. Because every euro or dollar used for training uh, it reduces profits. Now, with the Commission we are trying to understand the why is so and how can we can change it. And we looked at the international business accounting rules, which say that uh, people are not an asset of the companies because they are not completely under the control of the company. Therefore, they are a cost. And this was done in order to mark the difference from the time when they were part of the assets, when they were slaves. When people were slaves, they were counted as assets. And now they are counted as cost. So we are trying to change this. And I think that this would be a fundamental shift in the way in which we evaluate companies' behaviors, but also the way in which we look at public budgets, because again, investments, the we call investments in education and training is current expenditure. So we will finalize this report by the beginning of the year on the occasion of the 100th uh, anniversary of the ILO. I hope that the Commission will adopt this proposal. We are working on it. This would be, I think, a big shift also to achieve the goal four, but also to help people to adapt to the huge changes that technologies and, and so on. There is no way to have a circular economy applied to people. See what I mean? That now we finally understand we have to recycle stuff, but not people. This is just to say how old fashioned we are, uh, or late. And if we can change that rule, maybe it will be much easier also to move towards a full circular economy, including people. So everything that I am wearing is probably made possible through exploitation. Most of the items on this counter are made possible through exploitation and extraction. To get to lunch every day in our lives, we require an interaction with an agriculture system, an economy, a manufacturing system, a distribution system, a political system, an education system, an employment system, all of which are apparently organized and run through institutions that have failed to address what Sandrine was addressing earlier, not only the corruption, but the right somehow, as Chandan was referring to, to exploitation, the right to profit, the right to that extraction. Um, I live in Sweden, and on your chart, Sweden's looking pretty good. But most of the things I buy in Sweden are not. They're not made there. They're not grown there. And I'm not sure 
uh, how to begin to think about that, except for that in my own work with the SDGs, uh, it, to begin to really ask sort of the question that was coming from over here about the intersections. Um, and to, to ask hard questions. How is gender equality related to the health of the oceans? How is it that those two things are actually not two separate projects? What is the connection? What is that, that, that interdependency, that the, the sense-making, the rational world in which it makes sense for those forms of exploitation to take place across all these different sectors? Is it so different? And how can we begin to generate information that gives us that relational, contextual process um, in a way that is actually accessible? It doesn't seem like some abstract theoretical complexity because, like you said, you have to pitch this to politicians and school kids, both, and moms. Um, so I guess for me, one of the most interesting things that, you've, that has come up around this is this recognition that there's a shock and that one of the SDGs that isn't on the list is shock. Yeah, it's because it's in every single one of them. If we achieve any of them, we're talking systems change. And that's going to be radical. So, um, yeah. Yeah, talking about um, radical change. I, I have one example which shows also we can play, play out uh, actually in, in, in the model. It comes out quite uh, uh, according to you know, what we would expect is agriculture and the food system. It's not going to be good enough just to do a little bit things here and there. No way. And, and already 10 years ago, in, in the, the famous agricultural report of the UN, which I was the co-chair of, we already warned that we need a radical change of paradigm. That I, I think we coined the term at that time, business as usual is not an option. I mean, that was across the whole report. Well, Actually, it's true. If, if you try to model small changes in agriculture, you can see that you're never going to meet the, the targets of an agriculture who is climate neutral and actually even uh, um, takes carbon down into the ground again, which we have released over the eons, and certainly in the last uh, hundred and some years since we invented the plow, which is the dumbest thing humanity has ever invented. A lot of people think different, but actually that's, that's exactly what agriculture today uh, uh, is, you know, uh, uh, um, based on a technology which should have been <laughs> discarded long ago. So we know that in that case, we need a transformation system. But the transformation has to happen actually at the other end, at the consumption, the diet, and what do people buy. Farmers will continue to produce what people buy. So, so actually you have to go understand the behavior and then you have to have a behavior change and that will actually then trickle down. At the same time, we have to do more research in alternatives to green revolution. That model is long passé. It's still being promoted by most development agencies, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, the Gates Foundation, the big money in agriculture still goes in this antiquated model. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. And we know that we need, a, 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 a real uh, radical shift in paradigm. And, and again, maybe the only thing we can do is to, to, to show them, right? They use models, whatever they are, and, and they have to see it. And I think that's what we're trying to do. And those models are actually, they are, they are based on science, the best we can, we can find, but also on knowledge and experience. And that's why you actually rebuild those models with the communities you work with. And that is not only at national level. Those models now are actually used at, at regional level, sort of below the state, and down to communities. Because in the end, the communities will be the ones or who are actually going to get this SDG going. We have a framework, a legal framework on top, uh, policies. But who is going to do the work? And I think that's where we re may have to make sure that, that the SDGs um, become common knowledge. So we have to go to schools with this thing. So everybody knows. If in my own country, Switzerland, you go down the street with the microphone, about 10% of people maybe know what you're talking about. 
three years after the, the, the own government has said we're going to do it. I mean, the media don't give a damn about it, frankly. You never read anything in the papers unless your president go and gets blamed for zero results like ours. I mean, so, so th there is something there. We have to understand that it is not going to happen by itself, no matter how well-intentioned we may be or, or what we know about how to do it. I think we really have to make sure that those messages, whatever, also what we do here at the Club of Rome, it really has to go to the people, to, to the, um, yeah, the, the community. <laughs> I think going to the community is exactly what is needed. Uh, Angus made a point, and I think Chandra also made the point that if, sorry, oh, yeah. that there was a point raised this morning that if we were to make sure everybody has got uh, access to a decent house, we just won't have the materials to be able to do it. I've got news for you. The African continent figured out how to have sustainable, regenerative building materials hundreds of thousands of years ago. But because that's not seen as civilized, <laughs> it has been forgotten. And I think that's the reason why I'm so passionate about the abuse of this term, enlightenment. Because people were enlightened enough then to know that rondavas were the best configuration of uh, architecture, that you use grass or thatch roofs that actually insulate you. But all of that is forgotten. Mm. So I really think that in the process of pursuing the SDGs and pursuing the models, we need to go back to what really matters to people, their sense of dignity and their sense of belonging and connectedness. I forgot to respond to the issue of the IMF. I think that yeah. is a task on your generation's shoulders. Because <laughs> the Bretton Woods institutions are parcel by date, but there are too many interested people, and Europe is really at the center of it, together with America, of continuing to keep alive post-Second World War institutions that have really lost hmm. much of their value. Nice. The IMF, for example, is so tiny as a, 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 a financial institution that it really doesn't, it should just be a knowledge institution to give kind of data, but then they need the information to help uh, to, uh, to, to aggregate global knowledge with the new economic models and so on. So I really think that the IMF, the World Bank, and the UN Security Council are cake institutions, but they are absorbing billions of dollars every year, keeping people living in Washington who should be living at home and flying in for meetings. Latin America, the issue that was raised as well, which I forgot to respond to, I really believe that we need to keep, particularly the Club of Rome, our eye very open to the diversity and the wealth that comes from that diversity in terms of understanding complexity. You cannot understand the world without understanding. Because Latin America is also part of the old civilizations way before Europe knew how to spell the word. Thank you. <laughs>